Good morning, everybody. I think we can start. Uh, uh, I'm honored to chair today's seminar. Uh, today's seminar uh, is uh, focused on uh, long-term vision for rural areas in the EU. Uh, we are honored to uh, guest today uh, three different uh, Horizon 22 uh, projects related to the development of rural areas uh, in the EU. Uh, Sherpa, uh, realization and heritage. Uh, our seminar today is div uh, divided into two parts. In the first part, we'll have four presentations based on uh, the project Sherpa, uh, where we uh, have uh, Emilia Pellini, Monica uh, Tudor, uh, Pedro Santos, uh, and uh, me with uh, my colleague Pavel Kmielinski presenting the results of the Sherpa project. And uh, in the second part, uh, we'll have presentations from these three Horizon 2020 projects. Uh, so first, Alexander Matej will present uh, Project Ruritach, and then uh, uh, William uh, Kotles Altes and uh, Krzysztof Jans will present Realization, and finally, uh, Elodie Sala will present Sherpa project. And uh, this is worth mentioning that uh, today's event is one of the uh, list of a, uh, and a series of uh, events for the 50th anniversary of the Institutes of uh, Rural and Agricultural Development, Polish Academy of Sciences. We have, uh, we have planned five debates and five seminars, which will be our anniversary uh, events for this, for this, uh, for this uh, great celebration. But also, this uh, seminar is co-organized co by the European Rural Development Network, also within the uh, activities under the anniversary, 20th anniversary. Uh, both institutions are having, are having the rural areas in heart of their research, discussions, and uh, uh, activities to spread knowledge and, and, and share experiences, not only in Poland, but also in Central Eastern Europe, as it is in a, in a case of a European Rural Development Network, but also in a European Union. And that's why today we are meeting uh, to discuss the long-term vision of the rural areas. And I will be discussing this vision from the, pers from, from the several perspectives. Hopefully this will give us a very good uh, introduction for the discussion, because from one side we'll uh, speak uh, for our regions and like those regions will be represented by the multi-actor platforms uh, under the Sherpa uh, project, uh, but also supplemented with the visions or like the uh, seeking for the strategic approaches of the national policies for the future development of uh, uh, rural areas. And those uh, presentations will be supplemented with the outcomes of the three uh, extraordinary and, uh, and great projects that are dealing with uh, the problem uh, and discussion how the rural areas will look in the future. So all together we'll have the different perspective and try to discuss, do we have a common understanding what would be the future? Do we have a, a common enablers for this development? And what would be the findings of the projects in these terms? Um, I will come back very briefly to, to stress uh, those two anniversaries of the institutions that are co-hosting today's event. Uh, the one of the Institute of Rural and Agricultural Development of the Polish Ac uh, Academy of Sciences. Uh, this is our uh, fourth seminar. In this series, we had a seminar uh, on the inclusive uh, rural uh, development in the Central Eastern Europe. We had uh, a very nice seminar on low input farming. And a uh, few weeks ago, we also uh, met here online and in, in the headquarters of the uh, Institute to discuss the quality of governance in EU regions. Um, those seminars are uh, followed by the uh, big debates. They are debates uh, for Poland and for the Polish uh, for the Polish future. So we are discussing in a uh, honorable uh, with our honorable guest the, the, the future development uh, of the 
uh, of the Poland, Polish uh, rural areas and Polish regions. We had uh, one retrospective debate on what's in our history and like the history of a development, what's, uh, what are the, the characteristics they will also influence the future of, of rural areas. But also we had a very good debate on the quality of uh, governance in Poland. Uh, all those debates uh, are uh, and will be available, available uh, on our website. Uh, and also today's meeting is also uh, recorded and, uh, and will be presented on the website of this, of this event uh, on the Institute's website. And uh, and uh, University of Europe in Rural Development Network, European Rural Development Network is an organization that encompasses the research organization in uh, in Central Eastern Europe and in Europe overall, discussing the future paths of the rural development. So uh, so this is very nice. Uh, the seminar that is in line with the 20 years of activities under the ERD. Okay, so um, this is the word of the, uh, of the introductions and our seminar will be chaired by Professor Barbara Bilicko and I, will, I thank you very much. I will give the, the, the turn to her. Thank you. Uh, we can now start with the first part of today's seminar. So in the first part, we are going to have four presentations based on Sherpa project. Uh, so I'm giving the floor to the first presenter. So Emilia, uh, the floor is yours. You can share your presentation. Good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you, Barbara and Powell. Uh, I will share my screen. Um, so uh, first of all, um, let me uh, thank you, the Institute of Rural and Agricultural Development and uh, the European Rural Development Network for uh, this uh, invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to um, be here uh, today. Uh, I'm Emilia Pellegrini. I'm a researcher at uh, the University of Bologna. And uh, today um, I will present you uh, uh, things. Uh, um, basically, my presentation is organized in two parts. So first of all, I will present you uh, the results of the stakeholders consultation uh, to develop uh, two long-term visions for rural area, areas of the Emilia-Romagna region. And uh, the second part uh, will be dedicated to a short overview of the CAP reform uh, from the Italian perspective. So um, I will start my presentation with uh, um, the study that we conducted in Emilia-Romagna region. Uh, the aim of this study was to uh, develop a long-term vision for rural areas of 2040 um, within the context of of, first of all, the Horizon 2020 project Sherpa, as um, was mentioned before, um, uh, Sherpa is an Horizon project. I, I'm not going into details because I know that there will be a presentation uh, afterwards. Uh, but uh, uh, basically, Sherpa engaged, involved many uh, multi-actor platforms uh, across Europe um, to participate in the European uh, in the consultation, the public consultation that was launched uh, by the European Commission and uh, which uh, output was uh, the communication delivered uh, in the 2021 on the long-term vision for European rural areas. Um, so we participated in this large consultation. Uh, this uh, study was conducted uh, from spring to autumn uh, 2020. So I want, I want to, to stress the timing of this consultation because of course it was a, a very uh, peculiar uh, moment of our uh, history. Uh, so it was the first phase of COVID-19. In Italy, we had a very, as in many other parts of the world, a very um, strong lockdown uh, in uh, spring uh, 2020. So all the, the, these activities that I, I will present you uh, were conducted online. 
but also I want to, to stress the, this timing because, uh, um, as you know, uh, this was a moment in which rural areas uh, were, uh, um, uh, there was uh, um, very much attention on rural areas because we're in general, in general healthier compared uh, to uh, urban areas and uh, um, ap appear to be more resilient in that moment to COVID-19. Uh, the study was conducted in Emilia-Romagna region, as I said, said so um, in the uh, picture you can see where the region is located the uh, red dot is uh, Bologna uh, where is uh, the university uh, uh, in which I work um, the rural areas of uh, Emilia Romagna are very uh, heterogeneous rural areas um, the, the blue areas are the predominantly rural areas that suffer from uh, development problems and the ne negative negative demographic uh, trends, uh, even though uh, in general are healthier and uh, have a healthier environment. So. On the other side, we have uh, um, intermediate rural areas and urban rural transitional areas. That in, in these studies, we uh, the, the study that uh, I'm, I present this morning, we considered uh, together this area and we called this area uh, rural areas of the Po Plain. Uh, these are uh, more uh, developed uh, in, in economic terms uh, uh, areas uh, with the speci specialized and intensive agriculture. Culture. So um, the methodology of the study was a methodology that was developed by the Sherpa project. Uh, as I said, the consultation in Sherpa is carried out through multi-actor platform. Uh, a multi-actor platform is an arrangement composed of researchers, uh, policymakers, and actors from civil society. We also uh, based our study on uh, uh, literature uh, from backcasting and visioning exercises. Uh, so uh, our um, procedures uh, to stakeholders consultation was uh, organized into five steps. Uh, so we uh, set up the multi-actor platform with the representatives from science, civil society and policy. Then we conducted the inter individual interviews uh, with the, uh, the actor. Then we had the focus group. And based on this uh, consultation with the map, we could develop uh, a questionnaire that was sent to a larger group of stakeholders of the region. And then in the end, we could um, validate uh, together with the, the multi-actor platforms two uh, long-term visions, one for predominantly uh, that we call the hilly mountainous rural areas in this study, and the other for rural areas of the Po Plain. Uh, so, going to the first, uh, uh, the results of um, the vision on uh, hilly mountainous rural areas. Uh, so, in 2040, uh, th uh, these areas are expected to be more connected uh, thanks uh, to an improvement uh, in infrastructure that will contribute to uh, also to prevent hydrogeological instability. That uh, um, is a, a big problem for these areas. Then um, uh, uh, rural areas will be more connected to the global world uh, thanks to an increase in digital connectivity. Uh, then uh, um, uh, there will be a greater valorization of typical agri-food and white productions and the remuneration of ecosystem services linked to agriculture. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, this area will become the place where a range of services linked to nature, culture and well-being uh, will be available to uh, rural and urban population. Um, in the uh, graph, you can see uh, that uh, for each improvement, um, respondents to the questionnaire, questionnaire were asked to rate the desirability of the improvement, but also the probab probability to see this uh, um, improvement uh, uh, occur in 2040. Uh, and as you can see, for uh, some improvement, for instance, physical infrastructure, but also remuneration of ecosystem services and productive and profitable agriculture, there is a, a, a gap between desirability and probability. So we also ask uh, um, uh, about the um, main obstacles that can justify this gap. 
So I just comment on the, uh, may, the, the, the first three obstacles that were, were uh, cited the most. Uh, so first of all, the lack of economic resources and investments, especially when it comes to uh, infrastructures, of course. Then uh, large-scale distribution and market asymmetries was considered an obstacle for the develop of um, local supply chains. Uh, and finally, political inability for long-term programming, uh, especially to um, fight against uh, hydrogeological instability. Uh, then I will move to the vision for uh, uh, rural areas of the Po Plain. Uh, so in 2040, uh, they, are, they are expected to be more resilient to climate change. Um, keys to enhance this resiliency will be infrastructures, um, a greater economic support to farms, uh, a straightening of risk management and compensation tools, but uh, in particular, uh, there was uh, um, attention was paid, was paid to a greater collaboration among farms, uh, especially in the management of water resources. Another point was uh, uh, concerned the organization of supply chain uh, that is expected to improve with the straightening of the cooperative system. Uh, again, um, we asked about uh, the obstacles, uh, and uh, in this case, uh, farmers' attitude uh, towards cooperation was found uh, to be one of the, uh, to the main obstacles. Then the competitiveness of global markets, because um, uh, some stakeholders consider the global market as um, a factor that can penalize the type of agri-food and livestock production that is more focused on the quality, qualitative production rather than their quantity production. Um, and uh, finally, the lack of adequate incentives to support a more co uh, cooperative organization of uh, supply chain. So uh, I will conclude this first part of my presentation uh, just to uh, present you this uh, um, word cloud that was uh, derived from uh, uh, the questionnaire. Uh, sorry, uh, it's in Italian, but uh, uh, I, I think it's easy to understand that uh, sustainability, sustainable was the, the main, uh, um, the, the word that was, that was most uh, used the most. Uh, um, and the, the sustainability was touched uh, in both vision uh, in all uh, its dimension because uh, uh, rural areas were considered, considered sustainable if economic viable. If, so if there are opportunity, economic opportunity to live uh, and to stay in rural areas, then rural areas are sustainable if populated uh, and for uh, uh, see uh, rural areas uh, more populated infrastructures are uh, needed because af infrastructures brings also services and jobs uh, and then rural areas are sustainable if resilient to climate change. And if you are interested in this study, uh, we here you have the references uh, to the publication that we uh, uh, did. Um, then uh, I will move to uh, the second part of the of the presentation, in which I will try to give you a very humble overview of uh, the uh, current state of the CAP, uh, CAP um, uh, reform in Italy. So I'm uh, talking uh, about the uh, CAP strategic plan. Um, in Italy, we uh, so where are we? Uh, we now in December we submitted the, the strategic plan to the European Commission. And uh, we are waiting for the final approval of the, of the CAP strategy plan. So if everything uh, goes well, in January 2023, uh, 23, the implementation will start. Uh, I also wanted to mention uh, this other document that is the, the National Strategy for a Sustainable, Inclusive, uh, uh, inclusive Agricultural, Food and Forestry System. I wanted to uh, mention this uh, document that is uh, 
a strategic document that tries to uh, address in an integrated manner the challenges of the Green Deal, the CAP, and uh, in coherence with the, the recovery and resiliency plan and uh, the proposed the reform of cohesion policy 2021-2027. Um, so um, in this last slide, uh, I try to um, link uh, how can the CAP strategic plan, how could the CAP strategic plan um, uh, support the uh, visions that I presented? So first of all, the uh, plan um, uh, uh, allocate significant resources to, ecolo to the ecological transitions, transition because uh, 10 billion euros from pillar one and two were allocated to interventions with environmental goals, such as eco schemes, um, agro-environmental measures, and so on and so forth. Um, then organic farming, uh, more than 2.5 billion euros were allocated to organic farming, farming uh, trying to match the uh, farm to fork target on organic farming. And uh, uh, then uh, regarding equ equity and income uh, stabilization, um, the resource allocation of the plan uh, should benefit uh, rural areas with the development problems and small and medium enterprises. Uh, then uh, there are interventions to improve the competitivity of supply chain and to enhance local supply chains. Uh, uh, more uh, resources were uh, provided uh, to uh, use uh, in, uh, to support the youth in agriculture and so generational turnover. And uh, finally, the, um, regarding the diversity and, and the attractiveness of rural areas, uh, the plan uh, um, talks about uh, um, new um, instruments such as a food district, uh, smart villages and river contracts to uh, enhance the attractiveness of rural areas. And uh, I will stop here and thank you for your attention and I'm available for uh, any question. Thank you very much for your presentation, very interesting presentation. Uh, now we are coming to the second presentation, presentation uh, by Monica Tudor and Ion uh, Bruma, uh, both uh, from Romanian Academy, the Institute of Agricultural Economics from Romania. Thank you, thank you, Barbara. Thank you, and uh, thank you both Institute and uh, ERDN for the invitation and for organizing this nice event. Actually, I uh, already congratulate Pavel and you be, uh, because I think that this could be a very, very nice initiative for uh, sustainability of the Sherpa itself and the Sherpa platform. So uh, this cooperation between the three pro projects, I think, uh, could be a very nice uh, uh, starting point for this uh, sustainability and uh, could discuss that uh, uh, in the next year when we focus on the sustainability of our platform because we see here a lot of other colleagues that could contribute to this and uh, I um, profit from the LOD present uh, that is present here to uh, uh, focus on this uh, idea of the sustainability and uh, uh, building on the on this type of uh, meeting, let's say, between uh, uh, facilitators and monitors, and maybe we think in the future to invite here and to have here present uh, members of our maps, because I think that is very important that the members be present and know uh, more about other initiatives and other platform and uh, stimulate the exchange of information uh, among uh, this initiative uh, along uh, Europe. Uh, so I will uh, try to share my screen and put my presentation. Uh, okay. Good. Uh, I need to have a, a confirmation that you see my presentation. Yes. yes. Yeah, you see it? Okay. Um, so we are discussing and uh, I will try to present you together with my colleague Ion Sebastian Bruma that is uh, uh, the facilitator of the Romanian map in Transylvania. Uh, so a uh, few insights related to our work in the 
Romania during uh, the two when the, uh, uh, during the this uh, vision exercise, actually Emilia uh, make my uh, work easier because she presented already uh, the uh, let's say uh, methodology that was uh, used in uh, all the Sherpa maps, uh, and uh, for me it will be more uh, more easier to to go strict uh, strictly direct to the uh, uh, output of our. Uh, of our uh, presentation. Um, okay, um, some elements about uh, the presentation will have four parts. A short overview of Transylvania methodological approach. I will uh, go briefly to this. Uh, uh, Andrew will more focus on the long-term vision of uh, for rural in Transylvania area. Uh, on the long time run, run in uh, 2040, um, and some final uh, remarks also. So this is a map of uh, the location of the Transylvania map. It's located in Romania. You will see here in the in this map, uh, uh, European map with the Romania that uh, it's marked here. Uh, it's in orange and with the blue. Uh, circle, you see the location of our map, and in the bigger map, you see um, the Transylvania area. And we put here more uh, uh, lights on the ge geographical distribution and the structure of the Transylvania because we consider as being very important to know exactly. Uh, how it's uh, structured from the uh, geographical point of view this area because you see we have a lot of mountain area in the east part of the of the region and uh, plain area in the west and uh, we have uh, some uh, uh, very um, let's say uh, vibrant uh, towns uh, in this area but not so many we have Cluj, Oradea, Timisoara, Sibiu, uh, Bistrița as being, and Brasov as being uh, more um, vibrant and uh, economically viable uh, towns, but there are uh, seven towns uh, that are actively economically uh, uh, vibrant in this uh, period of time, uh, and uh, that they not cover all the Transylvanian area. Uh, some uh, elements related to the area. Uh, this area represents uh, uh, more than 100,000 uh, square kilometers. 30% uh, uh, is covered by Natura uh, 2000 uh, areas. Uh, one third uh, of the Transylvania uh, is uh, covered by forest. It's a, a very important asset for um, uh, from the uh, uh, from the uh, geographical point of view uh, related to the population. Uh, here live 6.6 .6 million people. 44 percent of those people live in rural communities. We are not discussing about uh, predominantly rural or predominantly urban. We are discussing about rural communities. So villages. Uh, Outmigration and the uh, aging uh, trend of the population, it's something that's uh, affecting uh, this area, especially when they're discussing about the remote areas that are, uh, that are located outside those big cities that I uh, mentioned before. Uh, those two trends generated labor shortage in those remote uh, rural areas. So, it's uh, this is a um, social and economical problem for uh, for the remoteness uh, uh, areas in Transylvania. Related to the infrastructure, uh, we uh, have in this area uh, a huge urban rural divide between uh, uh, huge cities and uh, their surrounding and other rural areas that are located uh, and are. Uh, at the more than uh, 35 kilometers from those urba uh, urban uh, areas. Um, uh, we uh, 
also are weaknesses to the fast disparity uh, faster disparities uh, cut from the peri urban areas because all the people uh, uh, that wants to work in the these uh, seven uh, uh, cities move uh, in the towns or in the surrounding area or in these peri urban areas uh, the infrastructure is developed very fast and uh, uh, this disparities divide be between urban and rural related to infrastructure, uh, social and uh, transport infrastructure, other types of infrastructure uh, simply disappeared in the last years. But but it's not the same time, uh, this, the same uh, trend for the remote areas. Uh, in those area, uh, this uh, deficit of the infrastructure is still persistent. Uh, and we do not see too uh, much investment in this uh, infrastructure for dedicated to these remote areas in the last uh, programming period. Related to the uh, economy, I already mentioned these large cities that are economic catalysts at, uh, at the, the regional level. Uh, it's important to mention that ICNT industry it's the main engine, engine of the uh, regional economy. Also, we have other type of industries, but the ICNT is the most uh, predominant, is the most prominent, and uh, uh, with the biggest increase in the economical terms. Uh, we have we have high agricultural dependence of remoteness, rural communities, uh, and the poor integration on agri-food value chains of the especially uh, small farms, uh, subsistence of semi-subsistence farming uh, that are uh, uh, predominant in these uh, remote areas. Uh, as consequences, we we have flourish very urban areas and on the other side we have left behind remoteness. Uh, these peri urban areas are more bedroom and acting as the food supply for the for the um, cities but when it goes to in the direction of the remoteness area we have this uh, semi-subsistence farming that are not integrated in the agri-food uh, system and uh, are, uh, let's say, a little bit uh, left behind uh, in when the discussion about the transition to the economically viable and vibrant rural areas. And um, when we um, try to organize the discussion during in uh, our map, uh, the attention of the people that participated to our uh, discussion was uh, more di uh, di direction edged in the uh, this remoteness areas because they consider it that we need to pay more attention to the remote area and not to the peri urban but uh, are already in the direction of uh, 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 faster uh, development uh, in the last uh, uh, ten years, let's say. Related to the methodology. Uh, we um, uh, follow the same steps that uh, was already presented in the previous presentation uh, by Emilia. And uh, uh, the method was Delphi. Uh, and uh, in the first step, we organized a uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, trends overview. Uh, and we look uh, also on the policy and the intervention that was uh, affected rural areas uh, in the previous uh, year. Uh, we selected uh, 11 uh, representative of the science policy and society uh, that becoming the uh, members of the MAP Transylvania. Uh, we discuss with them during uh, focus group and interviews uh, about the main challenges and opportunities for the next year in the map, also related to the, uh, let's say, how they see, when, where they see the Transylvania uh, on the horizon when 2040. Uh, based on uh, those um, uh, intervention and insight from the 
discussion is the map, uh, Transylvania map. Members, we, uh, uh, we organize a, a, a sort of survey uh, and uh, during this, the summer of the 2020, we received uh, 104 responses and uh, our respondents uh, was, uh, let's say, more, uh, more societies, 60 uh, of those respondents uh, comes from the society and 20, 23 from policy and 21 from science. Um, after uh, the analyzing the questionnaire uh, answers uh, from the questionnaires, we um, uh, elaborated uh, an um, a position paper, first draft of the position paper and discussing this, uh, discussing this position paper with so the uh, map for having uh, the, a consensus related to the vision of Transylvania uh, from uh, uh, the perspective on, of uh, 2014. Uh, so we go now on this discussion related to the uh, to the future of the Transylvania. Uh, as I I told you before, we concentrated more because was the uh, our members uh, uh, intention to go more in deep uh, in deeper. Uh, development of the remoteness uh, areas because they consider it as being uh, more important and uh, those areas need more attention from the policy makers and not only for the policy makers but for the society. Uh, we uh, uh, try to uh, synthesize some elements here and I'll not present all the elements of the uh, policy uh, vision uh, but uh, I will, I will concentrate our presentation on a few uh, very important uh, key messages from uh, desirable future in rural Transylvania. Uh, the answer to the question, how could the rural area ideally be like in 2040? Uh, the answer, actually, it's... Uh, uh, rather complex. They see those remote area being good uh, with a good accessibility uh, to social and business infrastructure and services that is more connected with the uh, stronger and connected rural areas uh, uh, elements that are presented uh, are, um, in the European vision from, uh, for the 20. 40 uh, period. Uh, the second and uh, very important element uh, is related to the fact that they see those areas as uh, having diversified rural economy. Uh, that this di diversification uh, is uh, perceived as being in the, uh, be uh, based on the smart approach of local potential. Uh, and supported by the entrepreneurial discovery process. So uh, this is more connected to this prosperous rural areas that is presented in the European uh, vision perspective. Uh, perspective. And uh, finally, uh, how they see this, it's related to the uh, agriculture. Actually, they see as being a strong, uh, as area with the strong family farming system integrated on short agri-food chain uh, and based on circular bioeconomy. So this last element of uh, the vision actually is related more with the uh, resilience of the rural area presented in the uh, European uh, uh, vision exercise also. So how looks like the desirable future for the rural area. Uh, we, many discussing with our stakeholder, they considered that the uh, desirable approach for the revitalization of rural area, especially when it's discussing about the remoteness areas, uh, is based on the local approach. So uh, according to the um, uh, map members and 
based on the survey that was uh, implemented during uh, this period uh, of the implementation uh, in Transylvania, we find out that uh, those, uh, uh, this area, the Transylvania and the Budnes area, need to base their revitalization process on the smart approach based on the local opportunity and constraints. So they need, they uh, stress out that we need to know and the local people and uh, uh, need to be engaged in this local opportunity and constraint discovering process and to know exactly those elements and build on those elements. Uh, also the second element is mobilization of the uh, uh, rural actors and involvement of all the rural actors in defining the local strategies and program uh, and uh, process to, uh, uh, towards uh, development of the rural area. Uh, and the last element is the building of rural urban linkages be because those uh, respondents and uh, the map, map members consider that the rural area could not develop by themselves. They need to input financial inputs and from the urban area because the urban is the, actually the main market for uh, rural products. So they considered that this could be uh, and is and uh, this uh, urban rural links needs to be uh, strange, need to be developed. Uh, and consolidated uh, when we're discussing about uh, not only peri-urban communities, but when we look and try to develop uh, remoteness areas. Uh, which are the enables to achieve this vision at the perspective of uh, at the future uh, rural Transylvania? Uh, so uh, I put here um, a graph that synthesize uh, the results of the survey. And uh, in the first uh, 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 columns, you will see the average weight of the re respondent, uh, res uh, responses uh, that representing uh, the choices of large and very large extent of um, uh, other, other question, uh, what are uh, the elements that will support the revitalization of Transylvania. Uh, but I, I choose to put here not only the, uh, the synthesis of the results, but the different opinion of different category of stakeholders to see if there are uh, convergence or divergence between the opinions of the stakeholders. And if we look here, we see that uh, when we go to the general uh, general perspective, the partnership and cooperation among local actors uh, is very, very important uh, for the development of the remoteness area. Uh, but when we go and uh, look on the category of stakeholders, we see that this element seems that it's not... Uh, uh, very important for the policy makers. The policy makers considering, considered that the professionalization of local actors is the most important uh, element in building uh, the develop, uh, local approach in the development of uh, remoteness area. So we see that we have, uh, let's say, a different perspective when we're discussing about uh, uh, those uh, enablers that achieve, uh, uh, that contribute to the uh, vision of the rural Transylvania between the categories of, uh, of actors. Uh, and especially, this is the difference between the policy makers and the other two categories of stakeholders. Uh, why, why I put this here, and it's not only uh, this graph, and I have uh, in the final presentation another graph. Uh, uh, reflecting these uh, div divergences in opinion, because those were was uh, actually 
the elements that uh, contribute mostly to uh, the long discussion on uh, designing the uh, national uh, plan for agriculture, national strategic plan in Romania. These di differences in views between the policy makers and the society and the science on the other hand. Uh, so it's uh, very important to, uh, to know Sorry, uh, Dutch, when we're discussing about the enablers and uh, to achieve this vision, we have two categories of uh, factors, Fact pre-existing condition and uh, uh, very important and uh, first order condition. But uh, when we're discussing uh, deeply on this uh, type of category of condition, we see that this condition that needs to be improved uh, are uh, more important in achieving the vision than the pre-existing condition. So, uh, we, uh, according to the stakeholders in Transylvania, we need more support for partnership and cooperation uh, we need the professionalization of local actors. We need a more involvement uh, of the local actors in the civil society act, uh, actions and raising awareness uh, of the large pub, uh, public related to the socioeconomic implication of uh, local development. Those elements need to be more supported in order to uh, uh, have a strong uh, and the vibrant uh, remote areas in the future in Transylvania. Uh, and those, uh, those uh, uh, aspects uh, are not in the, in this moment, are not so well developed. We do not have strong partnership and cooperation. Uh, each actors uh, act for their own the policy makers at the local level or regional level do not cooperate much with the society and science uh, and uh, that generates, an, uh, uh, let's say, an impossibility to, to manage uh, an uh, assumed uh, program at the uh, local level for local development, assumed for the, all the actors. Uh, Related to the professionalization, because the policymaker uh, put this emphasizes on this uh, professionalization. Actually, they uh, they uh, emphasize that the uh, representative of the uh, local government and regional government need more skills to put together on the same table the all uh, rural actors. So they need to those skills, and uh, I think that the Sherpa could have a contribution in this direction. To, uh, to provide them those uh, skills or to uh, find uh, or to uh, uh, show them uh, how to do it in this, in this perspective. Involvement of, uh, uh, of the local actors is very important because we have a lot of NGOs acting in rural areas, but they acting uh, alone. And uh, in the most of the cases, they uh, struggle to uh, attract people that are working together with them uh, in, uh, in the, uh, their program and the project uh, trying to develop the rural areas. So uh, they need to be more supported uh, in this process of attracting uh, local people in uh, their action. Uh, related to the, this, let's say, convergence, between the rural actors. Uh, when we uh, analyzing uh, the results of the uh, map uh, discussion and the survey in Transylvania, we uh, go to the conclusion that there are some convergences and uh, lack of convergences between the opinions. Related to the convergences, are also all the all the actors from the Transylvania are uh, uh, convinced that uh, uh, there there is uh, some elements that uh, represent opportunity 
that could contribute to the uh, local development in Transylvania. It's a consensus in the, in, the, in the identification of the opportunities, and they considered, all the actors considered that increasing demand for the local products, uh, referring to the agri-food and the richness of the rural assets uh, related to the land, landscape, culture, and so on and so forth, as the most important opportunities for the rural Transylvania. And they uh, emphasize that we need to build uh, the revitalization of the remoteness area based on those opportunities. But when we go to the direction of challenges and uh, interventions in the next year to, uh, let's say, capitalize on these opportunities, there are not so much uh, so many convergence between the opinions of the uh, policy makers society and science and i put here some conclusion related to this uh, let's say differences in opinion related to the uh, major challenges we see that is a big uh, uh, the discrepancies between the opinion of the those categories of actors infrastructure is perceived as being the uh, major challenge in the eyes of the policymakers. When, when uh, we discuss with the science uh, part of the map, they considering that funding and access, access to the fund and uh, uh, credits and uh, uh, let's say uh, public fund, uh, funds from the common agricultural policy and other policy is the main constraint for the uh, rural development uh, in Transylvania. And when we go to in discussing with the society, uh, they emphasize that the main challenges is the lake of uh, uh, local strategies, because they see that we do not have a local strategy, so we could not uh, build on, uh, on a business uh, based on uh, local assets, because this strategy uh, is not uh, uh, in place and do not help us to uh, uh, develop our business in the direction of the strategy. Related to the pre uh, privatizing uh, the intervention, uh, we also find a limited consensus between the categories of factors. So the policy makers considering that the, uh, they need to prioritize the intervention in the direction of innovation and digitization. They consider that this is the main elements that could uh, generate the development in rural area. But when we discuss this aspect with the society and the uh, science representative, uh, they have another opinion. They consider it that infrastructure uh, and diversification of local uh, uh, economy and vertical integration are the most important elements that could uh, uh, stay on the basis of the uh, national strategic plan or the uh, local development plan. So this is the difference between the uh, views of the stakeholders related to the uh, enablers of the, of the strategy. And this, <laughs> is, uh, this is the last uh, slide also, uh, actually, uh, when, I, uh, I uh, put the, this difference be, uh, in the opinion of the uh, stakeholders related to the uh, enablers that could contribute to the, uh, to the revitalization of uh, Transylvania. And here we'll see uh, where, are, uh, where are the main difference between the, these categories of factors. And as I stress you, uh, your attention before, see here in the policy makers, they consider that innovation and digitization is the engine for the rural revitalization. But when we compare this opinion uh, or with the opinion of society, we'll see that the members of the society that participated to the survey consider it as being uh, uh, less important. Uh, uh, actually, is the uh, last in the, in the last uh, uh, rank, uh, this uh, innovation and digitization uh, as supported uh, rural revitalization. So for the uh, society, we see here that they, they see as engine for the rural development, 
uh, of course, uh, infrastructure and basic services, uh, local diversification and vertical integration also, but also we see here with the green, agroecology and integration of a small farm in agri-food. So they considered as being uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, it's very important, this agroecology. But when we go to, to compare with the policy makers, we see that for them, the, the agri, uh, agroecology uh, and integration of small farm is not a priority, a first order priority. So those elements are, Cons uh, um, are consistent with the discussion during the conception of the national strategic plan because it uh, was a big discussion uh, related to the prioritization of intervention, uh, intervention in Romania related to those elements. And uh, also uh, because of this discussion, uh, our national strategic plan was delivered to the commission uh, in the uh, end of February. And, uh, and I could say that uh, the policy makers was those that uh, 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 succeeded to uh, put their, uh, their uh, ideas in the first, uh, in the first place uh, and uh, the direct, uh, and the, uh, let's say uh, the funding was uh, more uh, uh, directioned in the, in the uh, elements that uh, comes from the perspective of the policy makers and uh, uh, the society and science uh, uh, try, to find, uh, try to find a way in this uh, strategic plan to um, let's say, uh, put uh, some ideas such to go in the uh, needs and, the, and support the perspective of uh, these categories of actors and what's not uh, so uh, easy uh, to, to generate this, let's say, change in the perspective of policy makers. Uh, maybe in the other presentation, I will look further uh, in the national strategic plan and we come, we come with uh, some insight related to the distribution of the money and the intervention to the, with the policy. Thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have uh, some uh, questions, uh, we'll be here for answering your problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Monica. Uh, I want to remind uh, all the participants that after the end uh, of this first part, we'll have a short Q&A uh, session for short questions uh, to the presenters. And uh, for more uh, complex and general questions, we invite you to participate in the uh, general discussion at the end of this seminar. And uh, now I'm giving uh, the floor to Pedro Santos from uh, Consulé uh, from Portugal to present the results of uh, the Sherpa project in uh, his region. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, in particular, to my colleagues from the Shepherd Project that are present and uh, at this morning, and uh, to whom it's uh, been a pleasure to to work over these last two and a half years. Uh, my name is Pedro Santos. I'm partner and general manager manager of Consulai, that is the the largest advisory company in Portugal focus on the agri and food sector. Uh, and I'm the Portuguese facilitator of the Sherpa project. Um, and first of all, uh, I would like to congratulate the organizer institution for the anniversary is very important, for, of course. And to thank the initiative mainly to Pavel and Barbara and for putting together such uh, an interesting panel uh, on discussing this topic, uh, topic, and uh, uh, I would like to thank you for the challenging and say that it's a pleasure to be here and discuss and discuss this this topic with you. And further, furthermore, and this uh, is very very important for these days. I would like to pay my humble tribute to the Polish people and to all the other 
for the fantastic show of solidarity with the Ukrainian people who are going through uh, such a difficult time and you are making history and our truly thanks uh, with uh, and, and all my thanks is always be short for all that you are doing this is extended to all the countries uh, bordering Ukraine also and uh, for sure you are uh, really an inspiration and my deepest and more sincere thanks to, to you. Um, as a, a start for today's discussion and in, our, in order to highlight some specific characteristics of rural areas in Portugal, uh, I prepared a small presentation in which some indicators are identified and, uh, and their comparison between Portugal and the European Union and between Portugal as a whole and the uh, and national rural areas. And later I will focus my presentation on the discussion held at the MAP Center, uh, the, the MAP of the Central Region in Portugal, developed uh, within the Sherpa project. And uh, by the way, in Portugal, we conduct three different Sherpa uh, maps in different teams uh, related all of them with the long-term vision for rural areas. So uh, Portugal is a predominantly rural country uh, with urbans very concentrated mainly uh, along the coast. Uh, Portugal concentrates about 60% of the population in a coastal strip up to 25 kilometers from the coast. Uh, only Lisbon has a population of over 500,000 inhabitants and the metropoli metropolitan areas of Lisbon with 2.8 million and Porto with 1.8 million uh, inhabitants concentrates around 45% of total resident population of the continent. And in fact, of the 85 counties located less than 25 mile, uh, kilometers from the coast, only 19 of them have a population of more than 100,000 inhabitants. In the entire interior of Portugal, only the capital cities of the district, districts are uh, small, medium-sized uh, cities and uh, as you see, is uh, very different between the urban and the rural areas. And this, led, this leads, of course, to a very marked urbanization process, process and the uh, inability to rejuvenate uh, rural areas. And um, this is a real problem for, for the Portuguese uh, rural areas. Also, uh, to the population, population density, uh, in Portugal, we are slightly higher than the European uh, Union as a whole, but um, this is not real for the rural areas in Portugal that are quite lower. And uh, at the right, you can see that there are areas that uh, are less than uh, 30 people, by, per square kilometer, that is a, a very low uh, density in many of our, our country, a rural country. Uh, we also highlight another indicator that is the whole age den dependency rage, ratio, a ratio between the people that uh, are economically inactive to the people that persons that are uh, considered in, in working age and uh, as you see there has been uh, a very low uh, ratio at the uh, at the um, a very high ratio at the rural areas in portugal that are very very higher than the average of uh, european union also the share of uh, economic uh, dependence at the primary sector. The average of uh, European Union is 4.4, and the, uh, Portugal as a whole is less than 9%, but the rural area is 
uh, almost 20%. And there are areas where the reality is much more higher with almost half of the economy dependent on uh, agriculture. Um, and the processing power standard is about uh, 75 percent of the European average, but uh, at rural areas we are above 50 percent of that ratio. That is a, a very high difference and a very low income for those people living at rural areas. And a very, very important uh, point is the access to internet broadband that is very small comparing with the Portugal as a whole and the European Union uh, for rural areas. And this is a very uh, pro a huge problem for the digitalization that we all uh, expect for these rural areas. So focus on the central region. Um, and the central region is uh, very, very diverse and uh, asymmetric. As you see uh, highlighted at red, uh, it is a very huge area for our reality. Uh, it concentrates 22% of the Portuguese population, but is the region with the lowest unemployment rate and the lowest youth unemployment rate. This is uh, great, but uh, in central region is the, they have some important uh, context, geographic context, but because it makes the relation between the north and the south of Portugal, of course, and they have a large Atlantic coast is a space that is, they have a vast and diverse natural heritage and recognized landscapes and environmental quality. This is very important. And uh, we have some areas classified as world heritage by UNESCO. And uh, the pro proximity of uh, most important tourist and the really uh, religious site in the country, that is Fatima. And we have also tourism in rural areas, and we produce a, a lot of, uh, and we have a lot of uh, river beach and historic village at the interior of this of this region. Uh, I can highlight that is a very very good region to live, but not so stimulating as Transylvania because we cannot meet the Count Dracula, but. <laughs> We have uh, other things. So um, at the at the at the um, the Sherpa project, uh, we established this new rural map uh, at Centro. Uh, as you already see, Sherpa is based on the logic of creating this this linkage between researchers, uh, the, between science policy and society. Our map. Uh, have 23 members that nine of them are from policy and uh, seven from science and seven from uh, society. Um, before starting the Sherpa project, we had some reservations about the capacity to involve actors uh, who will have to sacrifice some part of this time to discuss these uh, teams with people that perhaps they didn't know. Um, in, this, in this particular case of Map Centro, we propose to move towards a region where we do not have some uh, strong network of contacts at, uh, at other regions in Portugal. Uh, but the truth is that we uh, focus on discussion on a team that still uh, with little a uh, small visibility in Portugal, but is very important for the future of, of Europe and future of Portugal. Uh, it ensures that the involvement of people and, involve, and the ensuring the involvement of people with, uh, with importance to the region, and promoting the visibility of the project and the conclusions, including the, the um, capacity of influence the national reality. The members feel uh, very motivated to participate and we have been able to, 
to have uh, these 23 members that are really amazing. Um, the difficulty is uh, to motivate the members all over the cycle and the, the different cycles of the of the map and uh, this uh, the, in the second side the second cycle of this map uh, was rather more painful to to have this involvement uh, which led us to refer, uh, a real reforma reformulation of the whole map for for this third cycle that are beginning mainly by concentrating the discussion at the smaller geographic level. Um, but it's very, very important, and I want to highlight that, that uh, the Sherpa coordination team has done, is done an extraordinary, extraordinary job uh, at several levels, but uh, especially at the quality of the production of the discussion papers. Uh, which allow to rise and to 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 increase the level of discussion and the enhance of all project approach. This is very very important to guarantee this 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 approach. Our meta methodology at the Map Center was uh, um, was uh, like uh, I think almost all the the maps all over Europe. And um, first of all, we try to evaluate which are the key region strengths that we should uh, highlight during the discussion. We have chosen, uh, the map chose the demographic change, the diversification of rural economy, the climate change and the digital, digitalization. Um, and uh, we, we would we have the discussion based what in what uh, are the challenge in the time horizon of 2040 and the, what are the opportunities for the region. Uh, we had a first online meeting. Unfortunately, this was done during the the COVID situation, and this was not. Um, it was not uh, able to do a face-to-face -face meeting, but uh, after after that uh, first online meeting, we had also an online survey for other contacts uh, uh, given by the MAP members, and we had 49 response, and that gave us the correct characterization of the, the central region, and then we have a final consensus meeting in order to uh, establish the future vision for the for the the regions the central region uh, the main the three main ch uh, challenge defined by the map were the the democratic revitalization and this is a problem for uh, portugal but i think for all the rural areas at europe um, and in um, in our case and in the case of the map center uh, it was uh, highlight the quality of life that uh, is is very uh, important to to highlight if we want to to increase the this renovation of uh, of people living in the um, in the, in this area and we have to change and create more value to agriculture and qualified employment in order to, to be able to develop these medium-sized towns and all the sub-regional urban uh, uh, around it. The, the second challenge was the relation between this demographic climate and consum consumption changes. Uh, mainly with the increase of the relation between research and innovation and uh, the actors at the uh, at the region and give us uh, a fair distribution of value during uh, of uh, all the value chain and uh, have a change on the consumption patterns of goods and services. And the third one was the robustness uh, and stability of the the governments uh, of the territory. Uh, sometimes we are not highlighting enough the importance of public policies in these territories, 
but it's very important to to build a different approach in order to have a, a much more involvement of the people that are living in those in those areas. So the desirable future for the central region was to create a diverse, young and innovative region uh, through fiscal attractiveness, digitalization and uh, infrastructures to create a resilient, uh, empowered and collaborative region. So the, this could be done with the attraction of talent and investment, of course, to the attraction of new inhabitants uh, as active agents and uh, mainly have uh, um, the rural and urban diversity and dichotomy that could be uh, seen as very positive for these um, new, new members that we want to, to increase at the region. Uh, I highlight here uh, also some some enables enablers that were um, uh, highlighted at the at the map discussion. Um, of course, strengthening strengthening the public services and uh, implementing living labs as a democratic demographic change. Uh, we also uh, want to motivate young university students that are already living and born in, the, in this, those territories and to stay there and create value there. Um, we, all, we also want to create uh, value for the ecosystem services produced by this region and, and by that uh, creating more value for all the region. And of course, creating, ensuring that we have internet access in order to create some uh, different approach and mainly to uh, guarantee that we have mechanisms to, to have more large companies and research and development entities to increase value at this region. So many thanks again, and uh, I'm available for all the questions that could be necessary. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pedro, uh, for the presentation. And now I'm giving uh, the floor to myself to present uh, the uh, long-term uh, vision for uh, rural uh, areas in uh, Mazowiecki region. Uh, I will present the first part of the presentation, and the second part will be presented by my uh, colleague, uh, Professor Paweł uh, Kmieliński. So, um, slide, please. Um, so our uh, multi-actor platform was uh, created within the uh, project Sherpa, so it was uh, its creation and it works were based on uh, the um, rules uh, created for the whole project, for all the maps uh, created uh, within this project. Uh, we created uh, our map uh, in Mazowiecki region. Uh, it was based on already operating local action group. Uh, uh, this action, uh, local action group is called Zielone Sąsiedztwo in English Green Neighborhood, and it operates in the proximity of Warsaw, so the Polish capital city. Uh, but uh, we included other stakeholders uh, to uh, make the, our members representative to the whole region of Mazowiecki, which is uh, the biggest region in Poland, and uh, uh, well, areas in the region are most diverse uh, in Poland, so in fact, uh, this is the big, biggest problem for us to uh, tackle all different uh, types of rural areas in the region and to create a vision for all these types of rural areas. Um, so uh, our uh, members uh, identified uh, different uh, challenges for rural areas in Mazowiecki region. Uh, the most important of them uh, were uh, poverty and social inequalities, uh, climate change and demographic shift. Um, our uh, members uh, came up with uh, a vision of uh, long-term uh, rural areas in Mazowiecki uh, and uh, they stated that uh, rural areas in this region should be vibrant and uh, that they uh, should uh, have integrated local communities that enjoy uh, both high quality of life and preserve landscapes and biodiversity. 
Uh, they identified demographic shift, uh, climate change, and uh, poverty and social inequalities as the most important challenges to make the vision a reality. Uh, they also uh, named several enablers for uh, making this vision a reality. Um, most important uh, was uh, for our members consensus and cooperation among uh, local communities and for real uh, stakeholders. Um, also, uh, climate smart policy needs uh, to be there to make the vision a reality. Uh, also, capacity building and knowledge transfer should be there uh, and uh, work well to make that true. And uh, we compared uh, their, um, the opinions of our uh, members with uh, the opinions uh, of uh, members of other maps uh, created within Sherpa project, and um, they were um, very similar. Uh, our members did not indicate as uh, key needs of rural areas uh, um, stable and sustainable demographic structure. Uh, but when we presented these results uh, of other uh, maps, uh, they said that they just forgot about it. And in fact, uh, they agree completely with the results uh, of other maps uh, that so we need uh, digitalization of rural areas, diverse rural economy, uh, and uh, the uh, climate change, environmental <coughs> issues are also very important for uh, attractive rural areas in the coming future. Okay, um, and now we also tried to uh, look at the, the Polish strategic approach concerning the uh, the problem of a, a long-term vision. So how how does it appear in our uh, in our documents, strategic documents at the national level, because like to, to reflect the, uh, to, the opinions of the uh, multi-actor platform uh, covering the Mazowiecki and the local territories, we easily see that, uh, that like the problems uh, are very different at the local level, but also at the regional. Mazowiecki region is very diversified. We have like the strong influence of the big agglomeration, but also remote areas that are quite, uh, let's say, poor or like underdeveloped, even in uh, comparison to other uh, to other uh, regions in Poland. So we wanted to see how it, does it look at the uh, national level uh, in terms of uh, the approaches and how it is uh, reflected in uh, what is it right now. But to make it very short, I will present a few uh, strategic documents that are, uh, that are mentioning the areas. One of the main that is uh, available for Poland is like strategy for the sustainable development of rural areas, agriculture and fisheries up to 2030. Um, uh, this is like the integrated sectoral strategy, which is like uh, which was adopted in uh, 2019, and it is uh, it is uh, this describing where sh should will be at the uh, 2030 in terms of uh, like the agriculture production, but also we see that there is like a lot of uh, mentions on the on the uh, rural development, rural infrastructure, uh, but also rural public services. Uh, also, like the in relation to demographic changes and the development of entrepreneurship, you can see that everything is there, like all the approaches. Uh, when we look at the, how is this organized, the strategy, uh, the strategy forms the other uh, should form the other activities of the Polish government for the agricultural area. So, like the primary objective it is uh, which is like the economic development uh, enabling sustainable income growth for the residents and also like minimizing the economic social and territorial disparities and also uh, with the strong emphasis on the protection of the environment uh, natural environment and we see three objectives uh, one is uh, related, the first is related to agriculture and fisheries for production. The second is related to the development of a, of a quality of life in the rural territories. And so we see the public services there, the small towns, the uh, cooperation between small towns and the rural territories, but also adaptation to climate change at the, at the local and the, and the regional level. And the third specific objective is like the developing entrepreneurship and also non-agricultural workplaces and active society. So this is like the, one of the basic documents. Uh, another one that was uh, prepared a few years ago is like strategy for responsible development. 
it will, it will show this uh, strategy uh, to show uh, especially that not only like the different uh, types of rural areas are present there, so which differs the approaches on the strategic level, but also when we look at this, the few enablers for achieving the vision in the 2050 uh, where it has, has been uh, set up and, and one of the um, like in black uh, bolt you see like what, what are the problems and what, what could be the possibly enables for at the le national level of achieving or like changing the status quo in this, uh, in this uh, relation. So uh, this strategy stresses the inf development of infrastructure, infrastructure, public services, but also mentions the quality of our as a, as a, uh, a characteristic of our quality of life, of course tackles the problems of a, related to the demographic uh, structure, also territorially balanced and economic growth and so on. Um, there is also the vision we have in those strategies. So, like the rural areas in 2050 are attractive places to work, live, recreate, and do farming or non agriculture activities. Of course, uh, this tackles with like the need for the uh, for the to fight with the uh, demographic changes and uh, support development of modern technologies and also, of course, support to mediums uh, and small uh, agricultural holdings as a part of the sustainable development of our agricultural sector. And then when we look at the very fresh and, and quite uh, like, like developed uh, recently a Polish Cup strategic plan, uh, we see that the, the, the situation that uh, like the all those strategic uh, documents that are uh, having like more than half of their uh, space or like the, the attention put to, to the uh, to the development of uh, rural areas and rural territories we see that like polish uh, cap strategic plan is like the very very uh, very limit into the very limited extent is coping with the uh, rural development understood as not non-agricultural one, like the, the, to, to, to develop non-agricultural functions of the rural areas and like the very visible, uh, uh, visible, uh, let's say, uh, like the, the proof of the, of the approach that is still uh, having the agriculture as a key enable for the rural areas uh, at the policy making level is that uh, the 15% the of the second pillar of funds was the, the already planned to be transferred to the direct payments. So, uh, so what is left is, is the cohesion policy because cohesion regional policy is tackling more and more uh, and dealing with the uh, rural areas but also rural urban uh, cooperation. So uh, this is like the, the scale of the support for those rural areas in the co co cohesion policy documents is not determined. So this is very, very uh, good question. And I guess a uh, good starting point for, for the discussion uh, from the uh, point of view of Poland uh, on the, the different level uh, of, of the limitations. So like different approaches in uh, uh, at the local level and a different uh, the, uh, the uh, national like all is in the in the documents but not in a uh, real life uh, so when we when we come to conclusions uh, rural, rural uh, inhabitants they know where they would like to live so like the, 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 the they focus and stress the need to ensuring the attractiveness as a place to live and work and like the rural areas as a place of, uh, and work means different for the different local territories uh, because different are the neighbors of of course different characteristics they, that, that show uh, the path of a future development so i will stop for now uh, thank you very much uh, thank you. As we are running out of time, so the uh, Q&A uh, session will be very brief and uh, we'll uh, limit ourselves to uh, questions already posed uh, in the chat. So I would like to ask Professor Krzysztof Golak to pose his question.
Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, um, well, that's, that's, I sent, originally I sent this question to first to presenters, but it seems to me that, that it might be also the question addressing the issues developed by other uh, presenters. It's, it's quite clear that's, what does that mean, this long-term long vision? Um, you mentioned uh, different dates, 2040, in three cases, and in the last uh, presentation by our Polish colleagues, it was 2050 and also 2030. Okay, that's, I'm a sociologist, I'm not an economist, I'm not a political scientist, and I'm quite skeptical about the kind of the prognosis or uh, trying to forecast future, etc. So uh, it seems to me that because today in contemporary society, the social changes, I mean, the complex changes, I mean, socioeconomic, cultural changes are first so quick and so complex. So uh, it seems to me that does, it does not make much sense to try to think what will be going on in 20 years or 30 years from now. And I just want to hear your comments to that and your thoughts about this. What does that mean long-term vision for you while you are you are doing your very interesting study? I many thanks for these four very interesting presentations. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so now I will uh, read the two other questions that were posed uh, in the chat. So question from Alexandru Matej to Monika. To what extent do you think uh, the predominant view of the policymakers about a uh, stronger need for digitalization is also a result of lobbying from the ICT companies, which have generally strong resources? And uh, the other question also to Monika. Uh, from uh, Professor Adam Czarnecki, what I see based on differences in opinions uh, on directions uh, is that um, policy actors uh, pay attention to measures, innovations and digitalization uh, while the society focuses on uh, outcomes. Mm -hmm. Uh, diversification of the local economy. In fact, they are strongly related to each other uh, or the outcomes depend uh, on measures. So it seems that society members might uh, be not exactly aware of what it, uh, of how it works. So uh, first I'll give the floor to Emilia to answer the question of Professor Gorlach. Yeah, thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Professor Gorlach, for uh, this uh, very interesting question. And indeed, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you that uh, especially if we consider the recent event uh, of the last month, uh, it's really difficult to uh, uh, think about the future even uh, of the uh, next year. So what about uh, future of 2040 uh, or even 2050? Um, so uh, I agree uh, that with your that you are skeptical on this. I want, just want to mention that uh, um, the visioning exercise uh, and uh, also the backcasting approach are a bit different from forecasting approach. Uh, forecasting try to um, forecast likely, the most likely uh, future, uh, starting from the condition that we see now. Um, backcasting and visioning exercise instead uh, try to imagine what uh, is a desirable future uh, even not considering the condition that are now. It's a, an exercise of imagination somehow to uh, step out a bit from the, the reality now. So to see, really to imagine something that can really change in the future, we need a, a delay of time that it's realistic that something that can actually change in this uh, uh, time. That's why generally uh, this kind of approach um, uh, requires to imagine a future um, at least uh, uh, 20, 40 years uh, far in the future. So it's um, actually it's the, the kind of approach that requires the ki this kind of uh, thinking. And also 2040 was uh, a year decided by uh, 
the project uh, Sherpa that was linked to the uh, public consultation uh, uh, launched by the European Commission. So it was not decided by the individual multi-actor platform. So this is my very short uh, reply. Uh, thank you very much. And now I give the floor to Monica to answer all the questions. Thank you, thank you, Barbara, and uh, for Co Professor Gorlach. Uh, also, I agree with the Emilia, and I want to uh, just to add something very, very short. Uh, you uh, mentioned that you are a sociologist. Okay, uh, we are people. I am a sociologist and economist too. But we need to have a vision about our life, our future, our future in our life. We could not uh, live from one day to another. So that's why maybe this type of uh, exercise is good, which uh, I, uh, um, I agree with Emilia uh, said before. Uh, actually, we ask the people to imagine their future, how they will look, uh, th this future will uh, uh, look like uh, in, 20, in the horizon 2040. Uh, indeed, was, uh, the horizon was uh, uh, in uh, accordance with the European uh, uh, union vision and uh, the project goes in this direction but uh, we need we need this type of uh, vision exercise even uh, uh, in our lives because we 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 need to uh, to uh, uh, let's say direct uh, make a direction from our uh, actions uh, and from this uh, reason we need to have a perspective so I think that it's, uh, it's be better to fix on uh, uh, time's uh, horizon that should not be last, uh, next month. Of course, we could have different events that uh, uh, could happen uh, in, uh, in, the, in the future, but we need to learn how to cope, cope and to, let's say, uh, reshape our vision but, or, or our uh, future to, to, to see how this, uh, this event could affect our, uh, our future. But uh, in a particular moment, we, uh, I think that we need to, to have this type of vision uh, for, the, for the future. Later to the uh, Alexandru's question, okay, uh, ICNT company uh, are not, I think that it's not related to the influence and lobby. Uh, of those companies is more related to the EU policy directions because the European Union uh, put more attention in the digitalization. So our policymakers assumed this digitalization in the, in the policy process and to put it uh, there, it's not um, related with the lobby of those uh, companies, more related to the EU direction actually. And I know that uh, from the discussion with the policymakers in the, in the Ministry of Agriculture, because I was part in the National Strategic Plan uh, Development. I worked in the leader, uh, in the leader uh, uh, measure uh, development. So I know directly from them uh, this, uh, this aspect. Uh, related to the question of the Adam, uh, okay, um, I, you, you said that uh, it's a misunderstanding from the perspective of the society. Yes and no. Why I said uh, no? Uh, because from the perspective of policymakers in Romania, innovation and digitization go in the direction of 4.0 agriculture. From, for them, this means innovation and digitization to put more, more uh, uh, internet tools and uh, digital tools in agriculture. Because in Romania, uh, the, the system of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, agricultural and technology and innovation system and the advisory system are not uh, functional. Uh, so uh, that's why they put more uh, attention on this type of uh, intervention that stimulated 4.0 agriculture. Uh, that's why the, uh, the society goes in the direction of diversification of rural uh, economy because actually they uh, need more type of uh, economic activities in rural area except agriculture. 
because in rural area we have only this type of, of uh, economic activities, but we need other type of services and other type of activities to have um, an uh, uh, social economic tissues to, uh, to be functional. So uh, that's why the people from uh, and society uh, put more uh, uh, attention on the diversification of economy that is not directly linked with agriculture. They need other type of uh, uh, economic activities that are not uh, financed to the common agricultural policy. And I will give you only one short example. Because I mentioned I was part in the National Strategic Plan development for the leader approach. That is linked with the rural development. And Pavel already mentioned that a small part of the common agricultural policy uh, in the next programming period, actually current programming period, is dedicated to the uh, actually rural development because most of those, those money goes to agriculture, even if they are in the pile or two, they goes to the farms. So it is a problem because we have 44% of the population that lives in rural communities. Those people want to work in other activities, not only in agriculture. So coming back to the, this measure related to the diversification of uh, rural economy, specific in the leader approach. So in the, first, uh, in the first proposal of the Ministry of Agriculture, those money that are dedicated to the diversification of rural economy in leader was uh, only di directed to only one activity, agri-tourism. For, for us, as member of the discussion group, was something very uh, crazy, let's say. Uh, we we discussing hour in hours with the Minister of Agriculture to stress out that it's, we need not only agri-tourism, we need other type of activities in rural area. And, uh, they, the Minister of Agriculture uh, finally admitted to uh, mention in this measure for the leader other, other type of activity, not only agri-tourism. They put it uh, via, uh, on, uh, uh, other types. They, they mentioned that uh, they could finance through this uh, measure other type of activity. Um, indeed, we could use the cohesion policy and the regional development plan to finance other type of activities except agriculture. But in Romania, um, those uh, money are more uh, uh, put on the urban development and uh, all the policy makers and uh, all the society consider, consider that the uh, common agricultural policy in the Ministry of, Africa, of Agriculture needs to, uh, to deal with the rural and agriculture and uh, uh, regional development uh, financed more urban areas and let's uh, and some uh, major transport infrastructure. So that's why uh, we uh, we think that this difference between uh, society and uh, and uh, policy makers needs to be uh, considered as let's say uh, divergences in opinion. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, I would like to uh, thank all the presenters uh, from the first part uh, of our seminar and uh, for everybody posing questions. Uh, there is uh, an interesting discussion on the chat. Uh, 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 Alexandru uh, uh, indicated the difference between vision and uh, prediction and forecast and uh, Emilia uh, agreed with him that uh, there is this difference and we have to uh, bear it in mind that uh, vision is not uh, the same as forecast or prediction of the future. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, we uh, cannot uh, have any other questions uh, at this time, but we are coming to the second part of our seminar. And uh, please uh, remember all your, all your questions and uh, have them ready uh, for the general discussion that will be at the end of the second part. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to Alexander Matei from uh, I play Europe, Local Governments for Sustainability Germany. Uh, he uh, represents uh, today uh, the Horizon 2020 project Heritage. Uh, so, Alexandru, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I start, uh, uh, Barbara, if you can help me, um, since we are a bit in delay, I want to know 
to what extent I should um, reduce my presentation. Um, I could try to do that, but it's a risk that I will mess it up a bit. So um, let, let me know how you see it. If you can manage in 15 minutes, that would be great. Uh, uh, but if not, just stick to 20. OK, um, I will try um, maybe not 15, I don't think, but I will try some 18, 18 maybe. Um, Please confirm that you see my screen in the full screen mode. Yes. Okay, good. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. And I'm already inspired about everything I heard. And um, I must say, I'm, I'm learning on the way. Um, I have a lot of reflections now in my head, but I will uh, not go in them because uh, we will not have time. I want to say um, uh, congratulations for the two anniversaries. Uh, let's go also for uh, bigger numbers. Um, second point, I want to say I'm kind of a, a Trojan horse here. Uh, my background comes from uh, urban development, actually, and it's a, a big passion. Um, but um, I have actually uh, started working on rural generation from 2011. And my main point in the end is on uh, an integrated territorial perspective. Uh, you will also see that in my presentation. Um, in order to, because I know this is recorded and I thought ideally should also go to a wider audience, not just between us researchers and so on, I will use a couple of more basic uh, concepts and I will also try to define them. So those that will look later will also understand a bit wider than just we are used to do work with. And... Um, Okay, I will also try to make the reduction of my size, but hopefully I don't mess it up too much. With that said, um, this is a bit of what I plan. I will talk shortly about the Ruritich project so everybody has an understanding of what we are doing. Then I will go in some of the concepts uh, that I need to, to explain in order to, to go in the uh, policy recommendation in the end, which are one of our other products. Short about the Ruritich project, the aim of the project is to focus on rural areas as laboratories which demonstrate culture and natural heritage as a driver for sustainable development. And uh, we do that to a heritage-led paradigm. We make use of six systemic innovation area. You see them here. I don't go in them one by one. And then we also have a system of role models on one hand, uh, which are working on enhancing regeneration plans that they already done in the past. And then we have on the other hand, uh, sorry, we have replicators, another group of local communities, which are trying to develop their first regeneration plan uh, for the region. The project is going to, uh, to be this year uh, ending its uh, journey. We already have some results. Uh, they are brought together in this uh, resource ecosystem from replication to lesson learned uh, decision support system and so on. But what I will focus later today is the policy recommendations. I will go now relatively fast in the key concepts. I hope I don't mess it up. I will talk about smart specialization. I will talk about the entrepreneurial discovery process, which is part of it. And then how all of this is going together in what is called research innovation strategies for mass specialization. Then I will also try to put a bit of question and indicate where culture and natural heritage are located and where innovation is connected with, with this, because their positioning is not so straightforward. Smart specialization is a place-based approach characterized by the identification of strategic area of, of intervention, and it's based on two main components. On one hand, analysis, uh, of the strength and potential of the economy. And then of course, this entrepreneurial discovery process. Let me explain this. This is basically a learning process with the aim to discover uh, the research innovation domains in which a certain region can excel. Um, Coming from the uh, uh, European Commission re um, uh, request policies and so on, we have, um, uh, reached to the idea to have research and innovation strategies for my specializations. And those are integrated place-based economic transformations. They can be and are already made at national and regional level. 
What is new here, and I, it's the only one thing I want to underline from the new period for the new cohesion period until 2027, we are talking about so-called enabling condition, and that is translated on the good governance of national and regional smart specialization strategies. What this means is basically, um, and the second component is that there is a wider discussion now going to incorporate the idea of sustainability. So you will see RIS4, RIS4 Plus mentioned, and that is about the sustainable smart specialization strategies for sustainability. And in practice, what they indicate is that that means that a region is ex ante aiming at improving sustainability and inclusiveness to an innovation driven policy. I don't have time to go in this, but uh, I, we can refer later. Also make a bit of a clarification on the culture and natural heritage. For this work we've done, we have mainly uh, look at the definition from the UNESCO side and the FARO convention. And in short, heritage, um, it's a rather complex uh, concept, but what we uh, want to say is that we talk about valuable elements from the past, sometimes also from the present, that deserve to be preserved and passed to future generations. Um, and the core point here we will see is uh, maybe the interaction between people and their environment. I also want to talk about heritage from a different perspective. Um, on one hand, and very often we think of heritage as um, um, culture uh, and with tangible, but we also have an intangible component, for example, songs, tradition, dances, and so on. Then again, we should always think that uh, heritage is not in a vacuum. It, it, it is located in a complex uh, environment, a space. So nature is the second component of heritage. And those should be seen integrate in an integrative way. More and more today, we also talk about digitalization as a heritage component, and we should gradually integrate that in the process because we don't have to, how to avoid it. And one of the last concepts I still want to uh, discuss and uh, put the basic is innovation. Um, I think we can all agree that uh, innovation is one of the most important factors for economic development and for raising quali uh, the quality of life. And very often we think of innovation from the perspective of new technologies, which is understandable. However, we should remember there's more in innovation than technology. We have innovation in products, services, business models, processes, organization, and those that maybe are a bit less known and new, we talk about social and environmental innovation, and we should be aware of them. With this base uh, in place, I will now enter the discussion about the policy recommendation we have drafted. They have been focused on the uh, integration of culture and natural heritage within research innovation strategies for my specialization. Sorry for the name, <laughs> the concepts are not made by me. And um, I want first to explain, so for whom are this um, made? Um, they are primarily addressed to regional public authorities who are either developing, implementing, or monitoring um, a risk-free, but as well, we also uh, make them for the public authorities managing rural areas, communities, towns, and small cities. Uh, in addition, of course, uh, policymakers, entrepreneurs, company managers, and those in research will find relevant things, but this is kind of like a, a second component. We have structured the recommendation in uh, five uh, groups. We have some general, we have uh, a group dedicated for governance, and then we have two uh, areas where we talk about uh, we, we talk about those that are at the start of the process of developing a risk free and those that are already implementing a risk free. Uh, and finally, we also indicated some synergies with other European program policies and so on. I will try to go in them and um, uh, I hope I don't go too fast to make it clear, but maybe one of the most important recommendation we have, and I already seen, we have synergies with what was already said in the previous uh, presentation. Um, it is very important that the actors from the culture, natural heritage, and those in the risk-free process should go outside their comfort zone 
and interact with experts from seemingly unrelated sectors. Uh, our colleague Monica previously said about the difference between the opinion of the policymaker and civil society and science, for example. This is also reflecting in this um, uh, lack of interaction. Um, as we know, innovation is often achieved where you combine uh, relatively isolated knowledge in new ways and when you have a new perspective. Therefore, it is paramount and we read advice the actors in the heritage uh, group to contact their colleagues in the risk-free um, activities networks and to express interest that they would like to participate and also bring arguments and ideas how heritage could be a source of innovation. On the other hand, uh, those in risk-free should also try to approach their colleagues in heritage, invite them in this uh, entrepreneurial discovery process also because enhancing can lead to new ideas. Um, and of course, this is actually the core of the entrepreneurial discovery process. It's a, a process in itself. Very fast, um, that's also an observation that these two groups, uh, let's say the entrepreneurial discovery process, uh, uh, the uh, research, uh, innovation, smart specialization strategy group, is mainly formed by businesses, um, entrepreneurs, uh, more from the technical side, and they don't interact very easily with the cultural heritage. That's why what we aim to do is to try to bring them together to have stronger relationship there. Going further, I also want to emphasize that we should bring together stakeholders from, uh, and experts from different parts. On one hand, the rural communities, but also the urban one. What we should emphasize here is to make sure that the grassroots contacts and networks from the rural areas are well represented since they will be uh, and play a fundamental role in the implementation of any action and on bringing together the community. Furthermore, we should embrace a wider view of innovation and try to look at heritage from new perspective. Um, of course, heritage can be a source of uh, research and innovation, um, and it's not just um, an object for uh, tradition, protection, and conservation, but for that we need the openness to, to look at it. Then I also want to emphasize the following element. It's, it's very often that uh, innovation is confused with technology, and I want to underline that that is a mistake. Of course, technology is a component of innovation and we continue to be, we don't deny that, but we should go beyond uh, the mainstream of, the, uh, of technology driven products and services and look on those which are most of the time forgotten, environment, organizational, uh, social and uh, environmental uh, innovation. Going further, I would like to say that we need to remember to investigate and explore the intangible heritage existing in your region, since it's an often forgotten and overlooked resource. And I want to give an example uh, from Spain. Uh, if I'm not uh, confusing, the Aragon region has uh, put the Spanish language as a, a set for their risk free, which is quite amazing in my opinion. Um, we should also uh, remember to reflect and approach both risk-free and heritage in a holistic and complementary way. Uh, try to integrate here, for example, culture with science, technology, entrepreneurship, and innovation in order to uh, do a positive economic, economic transformation. And this is also linking with what the colleagues were saying previously about diversification. Also reflect on heritage and risk-free in an integrated territorial development uh, process in which rural, peri-urban, in-between spaces, non-urban spaces are also considered and not just focus on the businesses and research innovations that are mainly located in uh, big cities. Five minutes, please. Sorry? Five minutes. Five minutes. I will do it in five minutes, I promise. Um, we should also look on the identifying synergies 
uh, with natural uh, connection with other con uh, complementary topic. You see here several of them, uh, uh, as it was mentioned before, ecotourism is mentioned, but also others. And because I make the connection to tourism now, um, I would like to emphasize that we should also go beyond um, conceive heritage beyond an opportunity for developing traditional tourism, reflect the possible new and innovative products and services, which are good for the locals, but also good for the visitors. And all the tourists can be in some case a solution for the rural problems. Uh, we should not see it as an universal panacea. Too often tourism is put as an alternative to all other problems, and that's not realistic. Um, in the implementation part, let's see, make sure that the entrepreneurial discovery process is sound and robust, and then we should look on the governance, monitoring, and evaluation. Um, those are often overlooked, and it's one of the areas uh, mentioned as a weakness. And if I go specifically for um, this region at the start of the development process, a couple of words, um, we should... Uh, we should see heritage not as a liability, but also an opportunity for research as a driver for innovation. Uh, we should reflect on heritage, that heritage can be uh, one of our niche innovation area and could be selected per se in the risk-free process. Um, and then if heritage is selected as one of these niche uh, areas, I want to highlight that we should make sure that the budget allocation are also reflecting the aspect. Too often, budget allocation are not in line with what we say in official strategies or public statements. So this is a problem. I'm going closer to the end. Some ideas about those implementing already risk-free. And here I want to talk about uh, the fact that we should think uh, critically. Oh, sorry, what happened there? Think critically, if you really should update your risk-free, that could be or not the case. And if you do it, also consider uh, the ex-ante aim of improving sustainability and inclusiveness, and that will make basically the transition from risk-free to risk four. With that said, um, I will jump off to this, but it's mainly about the fact that if you have a process, make sure that these actors are not blocking others to enter and trying just to protect their interests should be an open uh, system for everybody in the entrepreneurial discovery process. Um, and in terms of how we incorporate innovation and ideas in economy, we are many of us researchers here, but we should also diffuse the information innovation we create on the ground. Finally, the main synergy I will want to mention um, uh, is that you should think, and here is mainly for the regions, you should think that um, to incorporate and look at the rural revitalization platform, which is underway in being development. The European Startup Village um, Forum, which is uh, as well as the support for the rural entrepreneurs. And of course, the link with the action plan of the long-term vision for the uh, EU rural areas. I will want to conclude with something that incorporates all of this discussion. We, we have talked in the previous uh, presentation also about partnerships and uh, how we work together. Of course, it's essential. But to do that, we need a solid base. And in my opinion, the solid base is the following. There are three ingredients, fundamental, trust, cooperation, and continuity. And they should always work together. Without this, we have no chance to make real progress in any vision of the future. I will stop here. For those of you interested to read more, uh, it's much more in the policy recommendation. I put a link here and I'm happy to discuss any questions you might have. And of course, I also leave my uh, contacts for any uh, information. Thank you. I hope I managed. Yes, you managed. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. And now I would like to ask our colleagues from Globalization Project representing two of the partners of this uh, project, so Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands and University of uh, Brunswick in Poland. Uh, so please, Krzysztof and uh, Willem, the floor is yours. Thank you, Barbara. And I see that Krzysztof has managed to uh, load the screen. And the idea is that I start and then Krzysztof follows. I'm a coordinator. Uh, this project is about rural development and about the role of new rural generations. 
Next slide, please. Okay. Yes, Christoph. Yes, uh, it's, uh, it's working. Uh, as you can see, we have 18 partners and we are running now uh, for some years now. And we, we can't find more information on our website, ruralization.eu. And yeah, let's go to the next slide, because then we have more time for the content. Uh, the idea is that we are working on that the providing of this project is providing new opportunities for generation, new generations is key to have uh, a rural development. Uh, often you have a negative spiral. We already heard something about uh, rural decline, for example, in Poland or in the mountain areas in Emilia Romagna. And the idea is that by providing more opportunities for new generations, you can uh, uh, reverse this into a process in which there will be more rural uh, new generations, more economic activities, and again, more opportunities. So that is the idea of, 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 of flipping this kind of spiral. We're doing this following way. Please, next slide. So we have uh, in this project, we have uh, the kind of framework we started at to look at how we consider, what do we consider a decline, what are opportunities, how different concepts, the way how we select case studies. And we have done now parallel two elements, four set analysis, and that's where Crystal tells you a lot more about it. We have done a trend analysis, and we also have looked, talked about, say, uh, the rural youth themselves, or not only rural, rural youth, but also urban youth, how they foresee their future. So that is the rural dreams part of it, and uh, Christoph tells you some more about it. We've looked about promising practices. We have looked about what are things going well, what are things good, making study, and we confronted these with other regions and discussed them, and we are now in the middle of, 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 of making a report on, on the comparative analysis of it. And we have looked at a step of access to land, that is by how land markets work, how policy uh, uh, arrangements work, and especially also we looked about how many new promising initiatives by kind of access to land organizations work. Because the idea, what we found at least, is that the policies, there are hardly any policies for new generations. The most policies are based on modernization of farms, not about providing access to land. That the land market is often, uh, yeah, the strongest partners uh, get the most. So that's probably not for the new generations. And that is promising that it's, it's this NGO kind of organizations different and here did, we did also some innovations to look at how you can improve that and this week we will start with our new work on policy design and assessment we have our kickoff internal kickoff of this this is week so we will look at different aspects on, on policy development and now i give the floor to uh, christoph okay thank you william so I would like to introduce issues related to analysis of trends and the dreams of young Europeans. And uh, at the beginning, we can ask uh, why is trend analysis important from the rural development actions? Uh, because uh, in our opinion, if we know current trends, uh, present trends, uh, we could uh, make choices that would be effective and meaningful. Of course, uh, we, we don't have, uh, let's say, uh, we don't know if it will be, if it will be uh, of course, uh, effective because we don't know future, but we will try, of course. And objective of our uh, analysis uh, was uh, threefold. That uh, first we uh, focus on identification of uh, trends that have contribution of rural futures. Then we try to uh, do some uh, of assessments of uh, impacts of these trends of rural development in specific context. And then we try to assessment of selected trends based on the pot their potential to promote uh, rural regeneration in several uh, contexts. And uh, talking about our methodology, uh, identification of trends has been done through targeted search and uh, through national search. Uh, if you're talking about uh, targeted search, we, uh, it consists of uh, search uh, of trends in European projects, mainly European Horizon 22, but also other uh, previous projects from the uh, time period 2010 and 2020. Uh, we also uh, search these trends in scientific journals. We, we, we done uh, Scopus query, uh, uh, Scopus query in journals from uh, 
fields which were important uh, if you're talking about uh, rural areas. And uh, another part of this uh, targeted search was uh, search in future literatures in, in, literat in literature about uh, future uh, studies on websites, on, uh, on reports, and so on, so on, so on. And another part of our trend analysis was to, to searching for these trends on the national uh, level. It was important because this national search has been carried out in order to observe trends that are not reported in English because uh, we can uh, observe uh, a lot of trends or weak signals which are reported only in Polish, only in Romanian, and so on, so on. So it was uh, our, uh, let's say, in short, methodology. And uh, each trend uh, was uh, assessed for its general characteristics. So for instance, it was type. We have uh, mega trends, trends and weak signals, topics, uh, and uh, scale, we, in, 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 in case of scale, we're talking about European, global, local, and so on, so on, uh, about uh, domain, about mostly affected sectors, and about significance for rural areas in the short term, it's uh, three to 10 years, and, uh, to, to 10 years and, uh, and in long term. We also uh, try to uh, assess these trends from the perspective of uh, mind drivers of these trends, and uh, from the perspective of impacts on uh, some uh, important spheres of uh, rural uh, areas. I'm not sure if you, you, you can see a full uh, screen, but I think it's in some way uh, visible. Okay, and uh, it was uh, for us a very, uh, very interesting because we can assess, as, as I said, impacts, probably impact on this uh, important sphere of life. For instance, uh, impacts on social capital, on migration, and so on, so on, so on. And uh, another uh, part, uh, finally, through the aggregation of trends, we received uh, of, of trend observation, we received uh, 155 uh, trends, which are aggregated into uh, 30 topics. And the final results of our uh, work uh, was uh, some uh, so, something which we so-called uh, trend cards for the selected trends. And finally, we we obtain uh, 60 trends cards. And we in these trends cards, we we try to focus more. Uh, in more complex way on these trends. And these trends uh, was very important if you're talking about workshop, uh, we, if, we, if we try to share our idea with stakeholders and so on, so on, so on. And uh, what was, uh, from uh, my perspective, very important if you're talking about uh, these trends? Uh, I would like to present some ch uh, three charts uh, which showing the impact of this 30 trends topics, which were aggregating of uh, topic uh, of trends uh, observations. And uh, these charts uh, shows us the impact of these topics on rural areas. And uh, we have three types of rural areas. First one is rural areas within uh, functional urban areas. And uh, this uh, chart shows uh, this uh, aggregation of these uh, topics, of these uh, trends, and what we can see on this uh, chart. Uh, this quarter uh, shows us the most promising trends because they have uh, more than 50% of positive impact on rural areas and also low than 50% if we're talking about the negative impact of rural areas. So we can see these are the most promising trends if we're talking about impact on rural area. And in the, this quarter, which was uh, C quarter, we can see this, uh, let's say, more the most dangerous uh, uh, trends uh, if you're talking about the impact of rural areas. And uh, what is important, the most promising uh, trends if you're, talk, uh, in the, uh, if you're talking about rural areas within uh, functional urban areas, are these uh, related to networks, uh, these re related to lifestyle, food, uh, and also we have the uh, co communication. Uh, if you take a look at the rural areas in proximity to functional urban areas, we have uh, almost the same uh, situ situation, but uh, what is important, uh, let's say more than uh, half uh, of these trends are uh, positive, with positive impact on rural areas, but uh, if we take back, they are, let's say, there is more 
trends with negative impact, uh, mainly infrastructure, demographics, uh, resource scarcity, and uh, what we can observe it, uh, today in contemporary uh, conditions, uh, geopolitics. And uh, another type of rural area, remote rural area, and we also can see that uh, a lot of these trends uh, have a positive impact, but what is important, on the other hand, uh, also this share of these uh, trends with negative impact, it's also relative high. So we can state, uh, in, uh, if we're talking about this type of rural areas, these remote rural areas, peripheral rural areas, uh, they have already more options to harness positive trends related to these topics, but at the same time, they will be exposed to more dangerous to the negative impact of these uh, trends. What is also important if we're talking about uh, these uh, three graphs, we can see that uh, every type of rural area has other, let's say, uh, these more challenging trends and have uh, other trends with positive and other trends with negative impact. And the share of this impact is changing uh, if we if, if we uh, looking at this uh, different type of uh, rural uh, areas, and uh, another uh, part of uh, our research is dreams of young people about uh, their uh, future life. Uh, uh, why this is important from our perspective? Because we should not that these young people will be an important driver of uh, rural development in a decade or uh, so. And we, con uh, we conducted this research in 20 regions in 10 countries. And we, in short, we asked people, young people uh, in the age 80, 30, uh, please imagine your life in year 2033. What will be your uh, livelihood receipt? How do you earn your living? Where do you live? How do you live? What is your lifestyle? Please imagine how your life will be look like in this uh, year. And uh, also we uh, ask these people, uh, what are the main obstacles in realizing your, your dream? Of course, this is only dreams of young, young people in the moment of this uh, research. So we, we, we don't have, uh, uh, let's say, we don't know if they really realize uh, th these dreams, but at the moment uh, they want to, see in some place uh, in the world, in rural or urban areas. Uh, our research, our uh, dream collections uh, were organized in different regional contexts. Uh, now, now we can see the map of these regions where we conducted this uh, research. And what is important, we choose uh, also urban and uh, rural context because uh, as we know, uh, a lot of people who now live in the cities, in urban areas, probably want to move to the rural areas and, they, and, and then they will shape these uh, areas with, with their knowledge and their uh, other uh, values. So uh, now uh, we can see background information of the respondents. What is important, uh, these results cannot be generalized to the entire population of young people because it's not uh, statistically uh, representative, but we think it could give us some uh, regularities in the in these uh, dreams. Uh, most of young people are, uh, of course, uh, well educated. Uh, in our sample, uh, most of people live in the urban areas, uh, fifty-eight per uh, percent. Most, uh, a lot of them uh, uh, were students, and most of them uh, were uh, women. And uh, what was important, if we uh, take a closer look and 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 at the dreams, younger. Uh, Younger, young, uh, younger, younger uh, Europeans uh, had uh, had uh, more urban dreams. Uh, it was more related to the living in the urban areas, and older young Europeans uh, have uh, more uh, rural dreams. It means if people, if people being more older, they probably want to leave the uh, city because they probably are boring with the living in the city. And now is the graph uh, which are personally like like uh, more from, from our research, uh, this uh, graph illustrate, illustra illustrates the cross flows of the respondents between the current uh, place of resident uh, to dream place of re re residence. And if the dreams of the respondents were realized by now, uh, uh, the most people 
59% would move into a different type of region. And what is important, uh, where are the uh, biggest cross, uh, cross flows? As you can see, the biggest cro cro uh, cross flows are, are from city center to the rural area close to the city and from uh, city area outside the center to ru also rural areas close to the uh, city. This is the biggest uh, uh, outflows. And uh, as a whole, we, we could state that rural areas close to the cities and uh, remote rural areas, as we can see from seven to nine, would gain in popularity and all other regions would lose in popularity. What is, uh, I think, important uh, Today, let's say two years ago, young people mainly focus uh, uh, on these rural areas, but really in the commuting distance, in the close uh, distance from the city, because as, as we can suppose, they want to have to access to all uh, things which are uh, also uh, very, let's say, connected with urban style of life. It's, it's I think, also very uh, important if you're talking about policy. And, here we have uh, some uh, highlights from future dreams, but only targeted to the rural regions. Here you, you can see these rural dreams targeted to the urban areas. So, and uh, what we, can we see now? What, what is important? Uh, people, young people, uh, they dream about, uh, for, for instance, to live close to the city. They want to have uh, access to the services. But on the contrary, they also want to have uh, his uh, own space, uh, want to be close to the nature, and uh, also they uh, want to live close to the nature. They, 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 they like, uh, probably, they, they like gardening, community involvement, and it's, let's say, some mix of the living in the village and living in the, in the city or close to the uh, city. Uh, where, where the young people... Uh, see the main obstacles. Of course, financial issues, because they are mainly young people. And uh, another very important uh, problem could be uh, having a job, space limitation. It means mainly space limitation related to the uh, features of rural areas. Yes, it's uh, rather hard to uh, get a good uh, work, good job. And it probably be, it's also, uh, let's say, worst access to the services. And another very important uh, problem, let's say, it's personal life. How to live in the rural areas with family, with children, when we need to uh, get a good job, good access to the services, kindergarten, so on, so on, so on. So uh, we have briefly presented some of the results of our project. And uh, I think uh, these results indicate which areas should uh, be particularly targeted from, for the development from a rural regeneration perspective. As we can see, most young people think, uh, thinking about the uh, dreaming place close to the cities. Yes, uh, as, as we know from other hand, this is also uh, in Poland, in other countries, very problematic areas because of uh, uh, processes related to urbanization. So, as I said, uh, we presented only a part of our project, so I invite you to the, uh, our uh, website so you, you can find uh, all these trends in the trend cards and you can find uh, also uh, a lot of uh, reports with, which I think are very important. So thank you very for your uh, attention. Much to stop, uh, thank you for keeping all the time. Uh, uh, now, uh, last but not least, uh, 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 the presentation on the Sherpa project from LLB, Sala representing ECODES uh, Belgium. LLB, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Barbara. I will just share my screen. I hope you can see it correctly. Um, just maybe first question, how much time do I have? Uh, I can make it a bit shorter. Um, would 10 minutes work for you? Yes, perfectly. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I'll try to be fast. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thanks thanks to you, Barbara, and also Pavel for the invitation uh, to this seminar. And also nice to see so many uh, familiar faces to the Sherpa project today. So um, my name is Elodie Sal. I'm working at ECORIS, who is coordinating the Sherpa project. We started in two 2019. Uh, the project will end next year in September. And you will see that the... 
the, the long-term vision for rural areas has been um, a common uh, theme across the implementation of the project and has influenced uh, a lot of the uh, debates and discussions that we organized. Um, I've been asked to focus on the contribution of Sherpa to the long-term vision for rural areas. Um, so this is my, my presentation, so really diving directly into the subjects. Um, I wanted first to give you a bit of overview of the, the timeline and how the timeline of the long-term vision for rural areas, but also the project are closely interlinked. So starting in September 2019, the uh, European Commission, uh, Commission has announced the preparation of the communication on the long-term vision for rural areas. And since then, we have decided to really focus our work on the long-term vision. So by preparing, first of all, a discussion paper on the long-term vision for rural areas, the way that we work for the ones who are not really familiar with the project is that we organize um, discussions in multi-actor platforms. So you've heard already some testimonies and um, uh, feedback also from, uh, from MAPS, uh, so from Italy, um, Poland, uh, sorry, yeah, Poland, Romania, and also Portugal earlier today uh, from the MAP facilitators and also monitors. So um, we are starting the discussion with uh, what we call a Sherpa discussion paper on a specific topic. So in 2020, we focused on the long-term vision for all areas. And then all the maps, so the 20 maps have worked on this topic. So then we, um, we also contributed um, to the roadmap uh, initiated by the commission in September, followed by um, um, submission of um, what we call map position papers. So this is the main outcome of the discussions, uh, which are organized by the, all the maps in the, in the Sherpa project. So in November 2020, we received all the, the papers and we, um, we then uh, finalized it in the uh, position paper at Sherpa level. In January, we launched three, three additional topics, which were still linked to the, to the long-term vision. I'll come back um, to that um, in a couple of minutes. And yes, in February, so about a year ago, we finalized the, um, the first cycle, let's say, and we published the Sherpa position paper, which is a synthesis of all the papers um, drafted by the, by the maps. In March last year, we also attended the uh, Rural Vision Week, which was organized by the European Commission, which was dedicated, was a full week dedicated to the um, to rural areas. So a bit of a similar exercise, um, uh, which is done more at, at, at regional cities level with the European Week of Region and Cities um, in autumn. There was also the communication which was published in June last year by the European Commission on the long-term vision for rural areas where the action plan was um, well presented and all the different trends of, of, um, of work, but also priorities that the commission has, uh, has been working on. And that also, also uh, influenced uh, our work. So we presented um, last year in October, November at the COP26 and also at the European Rural Parliament meeting. We then, I launched uh, four additional topics this year, and we will uh, participate to the Rural Pact Conference, which will be held in June this year. So just to give you a bit of, of understanding of how we work also in Sherpa, so you understood that the first topic was dedicated to the long-term vision. And since then we have tried to narrow down a bit the topics, you know, because it's when you talk about a vision for rural areas, you can cover many topics. So that's what we've tried to go to be more specific um, year after year. So you can see the different topics there. I will go in more details right now. So in 2020, as I said before, we started with this discussion paper. Then we received the map position papers. You can see the, the Polish one here in the, as a screenshot and ended with um, a sharper position paper on the long-term vision for rural areas. Just a maybe key, key things from this paper. Um, so our first aim was to contribute to the debate that was launched by the European Commission on the, on the long-term vision. We presented through this document uh, the key issues that were identified by all the multi-actor platforms. Important to know that there's also an EU-level map in addition to the national and regional maps. And in this paper, uh, there is a 
a synthesis of all the desired visions that the maps have identified through a Delphi process and the enable factors, but also challenges and opportunities that were identified by the maps. And I don't have much time, but just the three main, um, let's say, um, key characteristics or headlines that the maps have identified through this process. Uh, first, enhancing smart variety in digitalization. So digitalization was something which uh, was very much highlighted by by the maps uh, as a way, as a tool to facilitate um, uh, change and also um, to enhance improvements in rural areas, to enable, to take full advantage of new and also emerging digital technologies and concepts, also to support the creation of jobs, products and services and new ways of working. Second point on empowering uh, local actors and communities. This was really something which was uh, highlighted and underlined by the maps as a tool and something really instrumental to the formulation, design, and implementation of, of future policies in rural areas. Third, uh, but not least, um, the enhancing multi-level and total governance, which is also linked to the second point, but this is also something that, um, which is quite important in terms of uh, having a Place based approach and a well designed and facilitated combination of government across levels, so local to European, and policy themes with representatives of private and third sectors, focus on place based and territorial approaches. Second part on the, on the concluding remarks, um, as was, it was as one mentioned a bit earlier, Sherpa aims at gathering three types of communities, so science, society, and policy, and, um, and these three communities are represented um, in all the on the to actor platforms. And here again, it was enhanced that this approach was very much, um, has proven to be quite successful actually in the project. And it's something which is um, something that uh, this approach and this, this um, system should be also repl replicated for future um, policy design and implementation. So our work in, in 2021 uh, focused on three, um, three topics, um, one on climate change and environmental sustainability, second on change in production and diversification of the rural economy, and third on foresight. So the, the last one on foresight, um, this is was quite directly linked to the vision because it was um, a continuation of the topic of the long-term vision for rural areas. So certain maps have decided to go a bit more in depth to have more kind of um, action-oriented discussion in their in their um, discussion in the um, in their maps, and the two others of of course were kind of follow up also uh, topics that uh, were raised during the discussion on the long-term vision. Um, so some maps, depending on their their challenges or depending on the specific topics that were important for them, decided to go more to discuss on more climate change or in the diversification of the rural economy. And for this year, we have uh, the same approach. So we want to also give the opportunity to the maps to, to choose the topic they want to discuss on. Um, important to mention that we have additional um, 20 maps. So in total, we have 41 maps uh, this year. So um, quite, a, um, quite a large number of, of stakeholders are being involved in the, in the project. And you see on the screen the four topics that we have decided to, to work on. The, Exact title will need to be defined, but it's just to mention that we'll, we'll focus, one topic will focus on the social dimension of rural areas, another one on digitalization and smart realities, a third one on land use management in the context of climate change, and a fourth topic on sustainable and resilient supply chain. Maybe a quick, um, I have two last slides. This one is on the, the Sherpa impact. So this is the, um, just to give you an idea of how um, we have contributed also to the, to the discussion on the long-term vision for rural areas. Sherpa was mentioned a couple of times in the documents as was uh, published by the European Commission. We are still very much um, in close collaboration with our policy officer who is um, um, very much involved in the, in the well, design of the, of the, of the long-term vision and the follow-up also within the European Commission DG Agri. 
We, um, as I said before, we presented and also led a discussion at the COP26 um, event last year um, in the green zone, it was called, um, on rural policies and climate change. So why rural areas are crucial for green uh, transition. We have been also um, participating to the European Rural Parliament uh, midterm meeting in October last year. So we are also trying to, um, to use this kind of multiplier effect that the uh, Sherpa projects aims to, uh, aims to be also. Um, and this is my last slide um, in terms of what's, what's next also in the context of the long-term vision. Um, as I said before, the 41 maps will work on, on the, the four topics I mentioned before, uh, which are still linked or are under the umbrella of the long-term vision. We will also, um, well, of course, attend and maybe participate in the, in, or speak at the, at the Rural Pack Conference, which is on the 16th and uh, 15th and 16th of June. Um, this year, and on the left side of this slide, uh, this is actually a screenshot of the, um, one of the slides that the, our former policy officer from the Agri presented at the annual conference in uh, earlier this year, where you can see where Sherpa contri can contribute to the vision. So there are many, I think, opportunities um, linked to this, uh, to, this, um, uh, to this initiative, and I think that Sherpa is very much uh, well placed also to, to contribute as well as other Horizon 2020 projects. So with that, I hope I wasn't too long. Uh, thank you again for inviting me and I'm uh, happy to answer any question you may have. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Elodie. As we are running out of time much too fast, so we are going to combine uh, Q&A and general discussion sections. Uh, first, uh, we will uh, start with the questions that has, uh, have already appeared in the chat. Uh, so, uh, first uh, question uh, from Emilia to Alexandru. Um, uh, you mentioned different types of innovations. Can you say something more on environmental innovations? Um, the second question also to Alexandru. Uh, uh, what do you think uh, of sm the smart specialization approach at a wider tutorial level, uh, micro regional or regional? And uh, the third question is uh, from uh, Professor Katarzyna Zabalinska to Krzysztof, and uh, it uh, concerns uh, the issue of uh, trends. Uh, so uh, first, I uh, would like to uh, invite Alexander to respond to these two questions. Yes, thank you very much. I, I will try. Um, first, I will say that I'm not myself an expert in uh, uh, environmental innovation. However, um, I think from what I know, also from the Commission side, there are some uh, um, materials on this, and I think they, they, they define it as eco-innovation in their case. And it's um, any progress achieved in the direction of sustainable development, and more, uh, and more specifically on achieving a more efficient and res um, responsible use of natural resources. And I will try to give also an example here. Um, in, in the case we have, in the case when we have um, uh, a river that it's uh, flooding, there are always two options. You have a technological option, you can make a construction, a, a dike, or you have an option to use nature in a careful way, in such a way that you achieve the same goal, but you don't need to, to use concrete and steel. Um, so nature-based solution um, is a component of that and how we use nature. Um, I will put in the chat a link regarding this so you can uh, save it. Um, with, with the second question uh, to, uh, from Monica, um, I, I hope I understand correctly the question, but indeed there are two elements. There's uh, this kind of a smart city, smart village component, um, which to my understanding was um, kind of became predominant on technology and ICT driven uh, in many cases. Um, and then what I was talking today about research and innovation, smart specialization strategies, they are, um, uh, I, I'm not aware of any of this made at the city or village uh, level, just at regional level. Um, the problem with this concept in my view is that it's a rather complex uh, element. And compared to the smart city part where we mainly look on technology and ICT in the, um, research and innovation, the idea is how we identified uh, key uh, 
priorities, uh, niche innovations that we can take up for um, uh, further research, where we can basically focus our funding to secure more boost to what we consider more um, uh, that has more chance of success. Today, I, I, I've needed to let aside some details on that side. Um, and here I also, because you mentioned about smart cities, I also want to make a an, an point. In my view, it is more important to start talking about uh, smart citizens and smart villagers. Um, you can have the best tool in the world, but if you don't have the skills and the context in the society to make the best use of that, um, then you, we don't have the progress. And I give an example. Um, I know that in, in East Europe, there are cities where the, the um, ICT um, field enter very uh, powerful with the smart city concept. They uh, brought a lot of um, technology like sensors in the city to measure all kinds of elements. Um, but the prof process after that was blocked because nobody knows who is the owner of the data and how to use it. And as a citizen that pay taxes, I'm more interested in what can I use it on the street than where my money go. That's why I also put the question at the beginning of our discussion about the lobbying of ICT, because I do think that there is a lobby that has a certain level of resource and power, and they are more interested in making administration pay for technologies that they need to manage later than in going the streets with a result. Of course, we should. I don't generalize. There's also good consultancy and good product and results that come in the street. But again, let's try to think in terms of smart citizens, smart villagers, and not technologies um, um, with that point. Um, I hope I didn't, I managed to answer the two the questions. questions. Yes, yes, thank you very much. And mm -hmm. now I would like to give the floor to uh, Krzysztof. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for these questions. Uh, if we, Talking about trends, uh, we, we, we thought about uh, forces and processes which are seen uh, in the present times and uh, mainly about forces. And we divided this in the mega trends, trends and weak signals. And if we're talking about mega trends, it was, uh, let's say, overarching mind streams that affects most regions of the whole world and uh, activities. And uh, criteria for selecting uh, mega trends was, for instance, uh, does this mega trend have potential for surviving the next uh, 10, 15 years? So, if you're talking about trends, we thought about uh, some uh, developments that are effective in specific regions or in specific activities. And uh, another uh, trend type was weak signal. There was only symptoms of change in specific regions or specific activities. And uh, uh, from our perspective, it was uh, thinking that we try to find a contemporary process and try to see and try to think how they influence rural areas in the future. From this perspective of mega trends, trends and weak, uh, and weak uh, signals. Thank you. Uh, we are running out of time, but still we have uh, a few minutes. So if anybody would like to pose a question or uh, a comment, uh, the floor is yours. May, may, I, may I be with the promise to be extremely short um, until the colleagues find a, another point. I wanted also to emphasize a, a, a last point here. I do think that the rural areas have a, a opportunity and a potential that is underexploited at this moment. And a power that when will become uh, clear uh, will change the powers between urban and rural. And that is um, the, the, the context where they are. And I will give an example here. Uh, so no city is actually put in the question, where is my air, water and food coming from? When that will change and when, when cities, so to say, will start to pay for this uh, free resources so far for air, air quality, uh, water, of course, food we do, uh, then the power will, will shift. And that's why I always talk about integrated territorial development. And to give the exact uh, example, because we have people here from Bologna, I know for sure a couple of years ago, there was um, a drought in the area and realization of what important is to, to know where your up water is coming from became a big point. Uh, Emilia, please correct me if I'm wrong, but to what I learned from a colleague, that was the case. I stop here. Yeah, it's still the case, actually. <laughs> so. 
And uh, I have a question uh, also related to what Alexandro uh, mentioned, because like our perspectives on uh, food, air and the energy is like the uh, rapidly uh, transformed by the war in Ukraine. So like for, for now we see even more that like the changes in rural areas are affecting also the changes in the, in the whole like whole economic systems yeah like also society so do you see and uh, would you, will you uh, try to capture this phenomenon also in your projects like what is your opinion what how this uh, situation will affect the, 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 the approach to the uh, future development of rural areas um, I guess this is the question to all of the speakers, but maybe someone would like to share uh, their thoughts on, on this issue. Thank you. Maybe someone can try to give some thoughts. Because for sure the, 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 the uh, perception of like the, the, the sources of the energy uh, is like that, and maybe also uh, the, the, the uh, crisis has always shown that the importance of the uh, governance, multi-level governance, first cooperation between different levels of the administration in tackling the problems, but also showing the problems uh, and like the opportunities for the uh, local governments, yeah, the, 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 the gain in an importance uh, in every crisis situation because like the, the local governments tackle with the problems with the citizens in place. So how it could possibly be uh, like affecting also the, 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 the how do we s s have seen the future rural areas development uh, till the February of, of this year? and how it will be in, in, in future. Uh, Powell, if I can react uh, very uh, briefly, the, uh, the first uh, thought that came to my mind uh, is about uh, um, land management. Uh, um, because, for instance, in our uh, case, in the next uh, cycle of the map, uh, we will focus on uh, land management and climate change. And uh, it, well, when uh, we uh, think about, uh, uh, in Italy, we have this problem to uh, uh, become more independent uh, on uh, import of uh, energy from uh, Russia. Um, there is an issue about uh, how to manage the land. Uh, if we want to move to other source of uh, production uh, of energy, uh, this, I think, I, I don't know if it's something that we will be able to deal with in the next cycle of the map, but uh, I can expect that some new uh, reflection compared to the ones that uh, we had before uh, starting, uh, I mean, before the, the crisis started, uh, I can expect that something uh, will, uh, some uh, consideration will be um, uh, said by the MAP members and also another issue that I don't know if somehow can be related uh, uh, to the crisis in Ukraine and the entire world. Um, there were many comments on how to improve the capacity of uh, land to uh, stock uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, so uh, now are really thought, thoughts that came to my mind uh, and I'm not even able to link everything to the crisis that we are uh, experiencing, but I think that these issues are, of course, uh, all, inter all interrelated. Uh, so this is my, my thought. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, I don't see any questions coming, so uh, just my brief comments uh, to the uh, public question would be uh, that last year in our map we discussed the issues of uh, diversifying rural economy and there was some components of bioeconomy that uh, we have to um, emphasize uh, uh, developing this part uh, of uh, rural economy. Uh, so there is place for uh, biogases production in agriculture and rural areas. So I think that uh, this direction would be uh, more important uh, given the uh, current situation. 
So I think we should uh, come to the closing part of our uh, today's seminar. I would like to thank uh, each and every uh, of the presenters and participants uh, for uh, the presentations, for uh, giving us insights into the three uh, very interesting and uh, very important uh, Horizon 2020 projects. Uh, I think uh, all of us will uh, reach to uh, um, the websites to explore more the findings of these projects. And uh, just trying to summarize, which is of course impossible, uh, what we see is that realization uh, deals with uh, quality of life and uh, uh, looks uh, at real areas from the perspective of its future. So from uh, the perspective of young people and sees their needs, uh, uh, their uh, approach to attractiveness of uh, rural areas. Uh, whereas heritage uh, shows us importance of good governance and uh, this trinity of uh, trust, cooperation and continuity in uh, working together on development of rural areas. And finally, Sherpa shows us also that empowerment and involvement of different stakeholder groups is very important to developing and uh, realizing uh, long-term vision uh, for rural areas and uh, this uh, importance of smartness and multi-level governance. So we see that uh, despite the differences, uh, there are also some uh, com uh, common uh, approaches and common uh, results uh, among these three uh, projects. I would like to thank you very much and I hope to see you all again in different seminars, conferences and projects. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you very much.